The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So I'm, I apologize, my voice uh, is not 100%, uh, so if you don't understand, uh, what I'm saying, please ask me. Um, so we're going to be analyzing, actually not really analyzing, uh, we described a second order method to optimize the log likelihood in a generalized linear model when the parameter of interest was beta, okay? So here I'm going to rewrite the whole thing as a beta, so that's the equation you see, but we really have this beta in an iteration k plus one, beta is given by beta k, and then I have a plus sign, and the plus, uh, if you think of the Fisher information at beta k as being some number, if you were to say whether it's a positive or negative number, it's actually going to be a positive number because it's a positive semi-definite matrix. So since we're doing gradient ascent, we have a plus sign here, and then the direction is basically gradient ln at beta k. Okay? So this is the iterations that we're trying to implement and we could just do this. At each iteration, we compute the Fisher information and then we do it again and again. All right, that's called the Fisher scoring algorithm and uh, I told you that this was gonna converge. And what we're gonna try to do this uh, in this lecture is to show how we can re-implement this using iteratively reweighted least squares so that each step of this algorithm is consists simply of solving a weighted least square problem. All right, so uh, let's uh, go back quickly and uh, remind ourselves uh, that we are in the um, uh, Gaussian, uh, sorry, we're in the uh, exponential family. So if I look at the log likelihood for one observation, so uh, here it's ln, sorry. This is the sum from i equal one to n of yi minus, um, okay, so it's yi times theta i, sorry minus b of theta i, then there's gonna be some parameter, and then I have plus c of y i phi. Okay, so just the exponential went away when I took the log of the likelihood, and I have n observations, so I'm summing over all n observations. All right, then we had a bunch of formulas that we came up to be, so if I look at the, con at the expectation of y i, so that's really the conditional of y i given x i, uh, but like here, it is really doesn't matter, it's just gonna be different for each i. This is denoted by mu i, and we showed that this was beta prime of theta i. Then uh, the other equation that we found was that, so what we want to model is this thing, we want it to be equal to x i transpose beta. Uh, sorry, g of this thing. All right, so that's our model. Um, and then uh, we had that uh, variance was also given by the second derivative. I'm not gonna go into it. What's actually interesting is to see if we want to express theta i as a function of x i, what we get uh, going from x i um, to, through to mu i by g inverse and then to theta i by b inverse, we get that um, theta i is equal to h of x i transpose beta, sorry, yeah, h, of x i transpose beta, where h is the inverse, uh, so which order is this? Uh, is the inverse of g and uh, composed with b prime, okay? So we, we, we remembered that last time. Those are all uh, computations that we've made, but they're gonna be useful in our derivation. And the first thing we did last time is to show that if I look now at the derivative of the log likelihood with respect to one coordinate of beta, which is gonna give me the gradient if I do that for all the coordinates, what we ended up finding is that we can rewrite it uh, in this form, sum of yi tilde minus mu tilde, so let's remind ourselves that, uh, um, so y tilde is just y divided, well, okay, y tilde i is yi, is it times or divided times? g prime of mu i, mu tilde is mu i is mu i times g tilde, times g prime of mu i. 
And, uh, and then uh, that was just an artificial thing so that we could actually divide the weights by G prime, but the real thing that built the weights are this H prime and there's this normalization factor. And so if we write it like that, so if I also write that Wi is H prime of Xi transpose beta divided by G prime of mu I times phi, then I could actually rewrite my gradient, which is a vector in the following matrix form, the gradient Ln at beta, so the gradient of my log likelihood at beta took the following form, it was x transpose w and then y tilde minus mu tilde. And here w was just a matrix with w1, w2, all the way to wn on the diagonal and zero on the up diagonal, okay? So that was just taking the derivative and doing a slight manipulations that said, well, let's just divide whatever's here by G prime and multiply whatever's here by G prime. So today we'll see why we make this division and, and multiplication by G prime, which seems to make no sense, but it actually comes from the Hessian computations. So the Hessian computations uh, are gonna be a little more annoying. Actually, let me start directly with the coordinate wise derivative, right? So to build this gradient, what we used in the end was that the partial derivative of ln with respect to the jth coordinate of beta was equal to the sum over i of yi tilde minus mu i tilde times wi times the jth coordinate of xi. Okay? So now let's just take another derivative and that's gonna give us the entries of the Hessian. Okay, so we're doing, we're going to the second derivative. So what I want to compute is the derivative with respect to beta j and beta k. Okay, so where does beta j, so here I already took the derivative with respect to beta j, so this is just the derivative with respect to beta k of the derivative with respect to beta j. So what I need to do is to take the derivative of this guy with respect to beta k. Where does beta k show up here? It's hidden in two places. It, no, it's not in the y's. The y's are my, I'm, I'm, are my data, right? But I mean, it's in the y tildes. Yeah, because it's in mu, right? Mu depends on beta, mu is uh, G inverse of Xi transpose beta, and it's also in the, um, in the Wi's. Actually, everything that you see is directly, well, okay, W depends on mu uh, N of, on beta explicitly, and, uh, but the rest depends only on mu, and so uh, we might want to be a little, uh, well, we can actually uh, use the, did, we, did I use the chain rule already? Uh, yeah, it's here. Uh, but uh, okay, well let's uh, let's go for it. So oh yeah okay, <laughs> sorry I should not write it like that because that was actually right. So I make my life miserable by just multiplying and dividing by uh, this g prime of uh, of mu. I should not do this right. So what I should just write is say that this guy here, I'm actually gonna remove the mu prime, the g prime of mu, because I just make something that depends on theta appear when it really should not. So let's just look at the last but one equality. Okay, so that's the one over there, and then I have xij. Okay, so here it's making my life much more simple because yi does not depend on beta, but this guy depends on beta and this guy depends on beta. All right, so when I take the derivative, I'm gonna have to be a little more careful now, but I just have a derivative of a product, nothing more complicated. So this is what? Well, the sum is gonna be linear, so it's gonna come out. Then I'm gonna have to take the derivative of this term. Uh, so it's just gonna be one over psi. Then the derivative of mu i 
with respect to beta k, which I will just write like this, times h prime of xi transpose beta xij. And then I'm going to have the other one, which is mu uh, yi minus mu i over phi times the second derivative of h of x transpose xi transpose beta. And then I'm going to take the derivative of this guy with respect to beta j with beta k, which is just xik. So I have xij times xik. OK, so I still need to compute this guy. So what is the partial derivative with respect to beta k of g? Uh, so mu is g of, uh, sorry, is g inverse of xi transpose beta. Okay, so what do I get? Well, I'm going to get definitely the second derivative of g. Uh, well, okay, that's actually not a bad idea. Um, well, no, that's okay. I can make the second. Uh, what makes my life easier, actually? There's no one that actually makes my life so much easier. Uh, let's just write it. Let's go with this guy. So it's going to be g prime prime of xi transpose beta times xi k. OK? So now what do I have? If I collect my terms, I have that this whole thing here, the second derivative, is, well, I have the sum from one equal one to n. Then I have terms that I can factor out, right? Both of these guys have xij, and this guy pulls out an xik, and it's also here, xij times xik, right? So everybody here is xij, xik. And now I just have to take the terms that I have here, the one over phi I can actually pull out in front, and I'm left with, the second derivative of g times the first derivative of h, both taken at xi transpose beta. And then I have this yi minus mu i times the second derivative of h taken at xi transpose beta. OK, but here I'm looking at Fisher scoring. I'm not looking at. Uh, um, Newton's method, which means that I can actually take the expectation of the second derivative. So when I start taking the expectation, what's going to happen, so if I take the expectation of this whole thing here, well, this guy is not, uh, and when I say expectation, it's always conditionally on xi. So let's write it. x1, xn. So I, I take conditional. This is just deterministic. But what is the conditional expectation of yi minus mu i times this guy conditionally on xi? Zero, right? Because this is just a conditional expectation of yi, and everything else depends on xi only, so I can push it out of the conditional expectation. So I'm left only with this term. Now, um, so now I need to, uh, sorry, and I have xi, xj, xik, xij, xik. Okay. So now I want to, um, I want to go to something uh, that's slightly more convenient for me. So maybe we can skip that part here because. This is not going to be convenient for me anyway. So I just want to go back to something that looks eventually like this. OK, that's what I'm going to want. So I need to have my xi show up with some weight somehow. And the weight should involve h prime divided by g prime. 
Okay, and the reason why I want to see G prime coming back is because I had G prime coming in the original W. This is actually the same definition as the W's that I used when I was uh, computing the gradient, right? Those are exactly this W, those guys. So I need to have G prime that shows up and that's where I'm gonna have to make a little bit of, uh, of computation here. And uh, it's coming from this kind of, uh, from this kind of considerations, okay? So um, this thing here, Oh, actually, I'm missing the phi over there, right? There should be a phi here. Okay, so we have exactly this thing, because this tells me that if I look at the Hessian, so this was entry-wise, and this is exactly the form of something of the form of the K. This is exactly the J K entry of xi, xi transpose, right? We've used that before. So if I want to write this in a vector form, this is just gonna be the sum of something in, that depends on i times xi, xi transpose. So this is one over phi, sum from i equal one to n of g prime prime xi transpose beta, h prime xi transpose beta, xi, xi transpose. Okay, and that's for the entire matrix. Here, that was just the JK entries of this matrix. And you can just check that if I take this matrix, the JK entry is just the product of the Jth coordinate and the Kth coordinate of Xi. All right. So uh, now I need to do my rewriting. Can I write this? <coughs> so I'm missing something here, right? Oh, I know where it's coming from. <laughs> uh, mu is not G prime of X beta. Mu is G inverse of X beta, right? So the derivative of uh, X prime is not, uh, uh, it's not G prime prime, it's, uh, uh, it's like this guy. No, uh, one over this, right? Uh, yeah. Okay. The derivative of G inverse is one over G prime of G inverse. I need you guys, okay? I'm not, uh, all right, so now I'm gonna have to rewrite this. This guy is still gonna go away, it doesn't matter, but now this thing is becoming H prime over G prime of G inverse of Xi transpose beta, which is the same here. Which is the same here. Okay, everybody approved? All right, but now it's actually much nicer. What is G inverse of Xi transpose beta? Well, that was exactly the mistake that I just made, right? It's mu i itself. So this guy is really G prime of mu i. This, uh, sorry, just the bottom, right? So now I have something which looks like is sum from i equal one to n of h prime of xi transpose beta divided by g prime of mu i phi times xi xi transpose, which I can certainly write in matrix form as x transpose. Wx, where 
uh, w is exactly the same as before. So it's uh, w1, wn, and wi is h prime of xi transpose beta divided by g prime of mu i, is the prime here, times phi, which is the same that we had here. And it's supposed to be the same that we have here, except that the phi is in white. <laughs> no, it's not there. Okay. Um, all right. So it's actually simpler than what's on the slides, I guess. All right. So now, if you pay attention, I actually never forced this g prime of mu i to be here. Actually, I even tried to make a mistake to not have it. And uh, uh, so this g prime of mu shows up completely naturally. If I had started with this, you would have never questioned the, um, the why I actually multiply by g prime and divided by g prime completely artificially. Here, it just shows up naturally in the weights. But it's just more natural for me to compute the first derivative first and the second derivative second. Okay, and so and so we just did it the other way around. But now let's assume we forgot about everything. We have this. This is a natural way of writing it. X transpose W X. If I want something that involves some weights, I have to sort of force them in by dividing by G prime of mu i and therefore multiplying Y i and mu i by this W i. Okay. So now, if we recap what we've actually found, we got that, um, let me write it here. We also have that the expectation of HLN of beta X transpose X W. So if I go back to my iterations over there, I should actually update beta K plus one to be equal to beta K plus the inverse. So that's actually equal to negative I of beta K. Uh, well, uh, yeah, that's negative I of beta, I guess. So, uh, so that's gonna be Oh, and beta here shows up in, in W, right? W depends on beta. So that's going to be beta K. So let me call it WK. So that's the diagonal of H prime XI transpose beta K this time divided by G prime of mu I K phi. Okay, so this mu induce this beta k induces a mu by looking at g inverse of x i transpose beta k all right so mu i k is g inverse of x i transpose beta k so let's do the sorry that's an iteration and so now if i actually write these things together i get minus x transpose W X inverse. So that's W K. And then I have my, uh, gra my gradient here that I have to apply at K, which is X transpose W K. And then I have Y tilde K minus mu tilde K, where again, the indices, I mean, the superscript K are pretty natural y tilde k just means that, so that's just y i, so that's just y i times g prime of mu i k, and mu, well, and mu tilde k is, uh, if I look at the i-th coordinate, it's just gonna be mu i times g prime of mu i. Okay, so I just add superscripts k to everything, so I know that those things get updated real time, right? Every time I have, I make one iteration, I get a new value for beta, I get a new value for mu, and therefore I get a new value for w. Yes? Uh, yeah, that's a good point. 
so that's definitely a plus because this is a positive semi-definite matrix, so this is a plus. And uh, where did I, uh, well, that's probably where I erased it. Um, Okay, let's see where I uh, made my mistake. So this, there should be a minus here, there should be a minus here, there should be a minus even at the beginning, I believe. So that means that, uh, what is my, oh yeah. Um, yeah, so you see, um, when we go back to the first, so what I erased was basically this thing here, why I, minus mu i, and when I took the first derivative, so there was the derivative with respect to h prime, so the derivative with respect to the second term, I mean the derivative of the second term was actually killed because we took the expectation of this guy. But when we took the derivative of the first term, which is the only one that stayed, this guy went away, but there, there was a negative sign from this guy because that's the thing we took the negative of. So it's really when I take my second derivative, <laughs> I should carry out some minus signs everywhere. Okay? So it's just I had, I forgot this minus throughout. So if you, uh, right, then you see that the first term went away on the first line there. The first term went away because the conditional expectation of y i given x i is zero. And then I had this minus sign in front of everyone and I forgot it. All right, any other mistake that I made? We good? All right. So now this is what we have. That um, xk, so, sorry, that uh, um, beta k plus one is equal to beta k plus this thing, okay? And if you look at this thing, it sort of reminds us of something. It's sort of, remember the least squares estimator. So here I'm gonna actually deviate slightly from the slides and I will tell you how. The slides take beta k and put it in here, which is one way to go. And just think of this as a big least square solution. Or you can keep the beta k, solve another, solu solve another least squares and then add it to the beta k that you have. It's the same thing. So I will take the different route so you have the two options, all right? Okay. So when we did the least square, so parenthesis, least squares, we had uh, y equals x beta plus epsilon and our estimator beta hat was x transpose x inverse x transpose y, right? And that was just solving the first order condition and that's what we found. Now look at this, x transpose bleep x inverse, x transpose bleep something, okay? So this looks like if this is the same as the left board, if WK is equal to the identity matrix, meaning we don't see it, and Y is equal to Y tilde K minus mu tilde K. So those similarities, the fact that we just squeeze in, so the fact that the response variable is different is really not a problem. We just have to pretend that this is equal to y tilde minus mu tilde. I mean, that's just the least squares. When you call a software that does least squares for you, you just tell it what y is, you tell it what x is, and it makes the computation. You would just lie to it and say, oh, the actual y I want is this thing. And then we need to somehow incorporate those weights. And so the question is, is that easy to do? And the answer is yes, because this is a setup where you would act, this would actually arise a lot. 
So one of the things that's very specific to what we did here and with least squares, we assumed that epsilon, when we did at least the inference, we assumed that epsilon was normal zero and the covariance matrix was the identity, right? What if the covariance matrix is not the identity? If the covariance matrix is not the identity, then your maximum likelihood is not exactly this least squared. If the covariance matrix is any matrix, you have another solution, which involves the inverse of the covariance matrix that you have. But if your covariance matrix in particular is diagonal, which would mean that each observation that you get in this system of equations is still independent, but the variances can change from one line to another, from one observation to another, then it's called heteroschedastic. Uh, hetero means, you know, not the same. Schedastic is scale. And uh, uh, heteroschedastic case, you would have slightly something slightly different. And it sort, of, it sort of makes sense that if you know that some observations have much less variance than others, you might want to give them more weight, okay? So if you think about your, you know, usual drawing, and maybe you have something like this, and you know, and, but the actual line is really, okay, let's see, you have this guy as well, okay? So I'll just put you here. Like if you start drawing this thing, it's gonna be, the, if you do least squares, you're gonna see something that looks like this on those points. But now if I tell you that on this side, the variance is equal to 100, meaning that those points are actually really far from the true one, and here on this side, the variance is equal to one, meaning that those points are actually close to the line you're looking for, then the line you should be fitting is probably this guy, meaning do not trust the guys that have a lot of variance. And so you need somehow to incorporate that. If you know that those things have much more variance than these guys, you want to weight this. And the way you do it is by using weighted least squares. Okay, so we're gonna open in parenthesis on weighted least squares. It's not a fundamental statistical question, but it's useful for us because this is exactly what's gonna spit out something that looks like this with this matrix W in there. Okay, so let's, uh, you know, go back in time for a second. Assume we're still covering least squares regression. So now I'm gonna assume that Y is X beta plus epsilon, but this time epsilon is a multivariate Gaussian uh, in say P dimensions with mean zero and covariance matrix. I will write it as W inverse because W is gonna be the one that's gonna show up, okay? So this is the so-called heteroschedastic, that's how it's spelled. Uh, and, uh, you know, yet another name that you can pick for your soccer team or, you know, a capella group. Uh, all right, so uh, the maximum likelihood in this case, so actually let's compute the maximum likelihood for this problem, right? So the log likelihood is what? Well, we're gonna have the term uh, that tells us that it's gonna be, so, okay. What is the density of a multivariate Gaussian? So it's gonna be a multivariate Gaussian in P dimension with mean X beta and covariance matrix W inverse, right? So that's the density that we want. Well, it's of the form one over um, determinant of W inverse uh, times two pi to the P over two, okay? and uh, uh, times exponential, and now what I have is x minus x beta transpose w, so that's the inverse of w inverse, x minus x beta divided by two, okay? So this is x minus mu transpose sigma inverse x minus mu divided by two, and if you want a sanity check, just assume that uh, um, sigma, yeah. Well, you know, if you want this to be y, then this is y, right? Sure. Yeah, it's maybe it's less confusing. So if you do uh, p is equal to one, then what does it mean? It means that you have this mean here. So let's forget about what it is. But this guy is going to be just one sigma squared, right? So what you see here is the inverse of sigma squared. So that's gonna be two over two sigma squared like we usually see it. The determinant of W inverse is just the product of the entry of the one by one matrix, which is just 
1 over, uh, which is just uh, sigma square. Okay, so that should be actually, uh, yeah, no, that's actually, yeah, that's sigma square. And then I have this 2 pi, so square root of this, because p is equal to 1, I get sigma square root 2 pi, which is the normalization that I get. This is not going to matter, because when I look at the log likelihood as a function of beta, so I'm assuming that w is known, what I get is something which is a constant, so it's minus p minus n times p over 2 times log that w inverse times 2 pi. Okay, so this is just going to be a constant. It won't matter when I do the maximum likelihood. And then I'm going to have what? I'm going to have plus 1 half of y minus x beta transpose w y minus x beta. So if I want to take the minimum, the maximum of this guy, sorry, there's a minus here. So if I want to take the maximum of this guy, I'm going to have to take the minimum of this thing. And the minimum of this thing, if you take the derivatives, you get to C. So that's, the, that's what we have, right? We need to compute the minimum of y minus x beta transpose w minus x, uh, y minus x beta. And the solution that you get, I mean, you can actually check this uh, uh, for yourself. The way you can see this is by doing the following. If you're lazy and you don't want to redo the entire thing, uh, maybe I should put that guy. W is diagonal, right? I'm going to assume that, uh, so W inverse is diagonal, and I'm going to assume that no variance is equal to 0 and no variance is equal to infinity, so that both W inverse and W have only uh, positive entries on the diagonal, all right? So in particular, I can talk about the square root of W, which is just the matrix, the diagonal matrix with the square roots on the diagonal, okay? And so I want to minimize in beta y minus x beta transpose w y minus x beta. So I'm going to write w as square root of w times square root of w, which I can, because w, and it's just the simplest thing, right? If w is w1, wn, so that's my w, then square root of w is just square root of w1, square root of wn, and then zeros elsewhere. So the product of those two matrices gives me definitely back what I want. And that's the usual matrix product. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to push one on one side and push the other one on the other side. So that gives me that this is really the minimum over beta of, well, here I have this transpose, so I have to put it on the other side. W is clearly symmetric, and square root, so is square root of W. So the transpose doesn't matter. And so what I'm left with is square root of W y minus square root of W x beta transpose and then times itself. So that's uh, square root w y minus square root w, I don't have enough space, x beta. Okay, and that stops here. But this is the same thing that we've been doing before. This is a new y, let's call it y prime. This is a new x, let's call it x prime. And now this is just the least squares estimator associated to a response y prime and a design matrix x prime. So I know that the solution is x prime transpose x prime inverse x prime transpose y prime. And now I'm just going to substitute again what my x prime is in terms of x and what my y prime is in terms of y. And that gives me exactly x w square root w square root w x inverse. And then I have x transpose square root w for this guy. And then I have square root w y for that guy. And that's exactly what I wanted. I'm left with x transpose w x inverse x transpose w y. Okay, so that's a simple way to take into account the W that uh, we had before. And you could actually do it with any matrix 
that's positive semi-definite because you can actually talk about the square root of those matrices. It's just uh, the square root of a matrix is just a matrix such that when you multiply it by itself, it gives you the original matrix. Okay. So here that was just a shortcut into that consisted in saying, okay, maybe I don't want to recompute the gradient of this quantity set it equal to zero and see what beta hat should be. I instead I, I'm gonna assume that I already know that if I did not have the W, I would know how to solve it. And that's exactly what I did. I said, well, let's I know that this is the minimum of something that looks like this when I have the primes and then I just substitute back my W in there. All right, so that's just the lazy computation. But again, if you don't like it, you can always take the gradient of this guy. Yeah? Why is the solution that you tried to make a mistake? Because there's a mistake. Yeah, there's a mistake on the slide. Uh, how did I make that one? I'm actually trying to parse it back. Um, I mean, it's clearly wrong, right? Oh, no, it's not. No, it is. Uh, so it's not clearly wrong. Uh, Actually, it is clearly wrong. Because if I put the identity here, those are still associative, right? So this product is actually not compatible. So it's wrong, but there's just this extra thing that I probably copy pasted from someplace. So this is one of my latest slides. I'll just uh, color it in white. And, uh, but yeah, sorry, there's a mis this, this parenthesis is not here. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Because I have two of them. I have one that comes from the X prime that's here, yeah. this guy, and then I have one that comes from the, this guy here. Okay, so the solution, uh, let's write it in some place that's actually uh, literable. <coughs> Which is the correction for this thing is X transpose W X inverse X transpose W Y, okay? So you just uh, squeeze in this W in there, and that's exactly what we had before. X transpose W, X inverse, X transpose W, some Y, okay? And what I claim is that this is routinely implemented. As you can imagine, heteroscedastic linear regression is something that's very common. Uh, so every time you have a least squares uh, formula, you also have a way to put in some weights. You can you don't have to put diagonal weights, but here that's all we need. And uh, so here on the slides, again, I took the beta k and I put it in there so that I have only one least square solution to, to, to formulate. But uh, let's do it slightly differently. What I'm going to do here now is I'm going to say, okay, let's feed to some least squares. So let's do weighted least squares on uh, response y being uh, y tilde k minus mu tilde k and uh, design matrix being well just uh, x itself so that doesn't change and and the weights oops so the weights are what the weights are the wk that i had here so W K I is uh, H prime of X I transpose beta K divided by G prime of mu I at time K times phi. Okay, and so I, uh, this, if I solve it, We'll spit out something that I will call a solution. I will call it um, uh, u hat k plus one. And to get beta hat k plus one, all I need to do 
is to do beta k plus u hat k plus 1. Oh, sorry, beta, yeah. OK? And that's because, so here that's not clear, but I started from there, remember? I started from uh, this guy here. So I'm just solving a least squared that's a weighted least squared that's going to give me this thing. That's what I called u hat k plus 1. And then I add it to beta k, and that gives me beta k minus 1. So I just have this intermediate step, which is removed in the slide. OK? So then you can repeat until convergence. What does it mean to repeat until convergence? Yeah, exactly. So you just set some threshold and you say, I, I promise you that this will converge, right? So you know that at some point you're going to be there, but uh, you're going to go there, but you're never going to be exactly there. And so you just say, OK, I want this accuracy on my beta. Actually, the machine is a little uh, uh, strong, right? Especially if you have 10 observations to start with, you know you're going to have something that's um, uh, going to be, that's going to have some statistical error. So that should actually guide you into what kind of error you want to be making. So for example, a good rule of thumb is that if you have uh, n observations, you just take some within, uh, if you want the L2 distance between uh, the beta, the two consecutive beta to be less than 1 over n, you should be good enough. It doesn't have to be the precision, machine precision. Uh, and uh, uh, so is it clear how we do this, right? So here I have, I just have to maintain a bunch of things, right? So remember, when I want to recompute, every, at every step I have to recompute a bunch of things. So I have to recompute the weights. But if I want to recompute the weights, not only do I need the previous iterate, but I need to know how the previous iterate impacts my, um, my means. So at each step, I have to recalculate mu i k by doing g prime, Right, remember mu i k was just g prime, uh, g uh, inverse of x i transpose beta k, right? So I have to recompute that. And then I use this to compute my weights. I also use this uh, to compute uh, my y, right? So my y depends also on g prime of mu i k. I feed that to my weighted least squares uh, uh, engine. It spits out the u hat k that I add to my previous beta k, and that gives me my new beta k plus 1. OK, so here's the pseudo code if you want to take some time uh, to uh, parse it. All right, so here again, the trick is not much. It's just saying if you don't feel like implementing uh, Fisher scoring or inverting your Hessian at every step, then a weighted least squares is actually going to do it for you automatically. All right, and that's just a numerical trick. There's nothing really statistical about this, except the fact that, you know, this closed form solution for each of the step reminded us of um, reminded us of some least squares, and except that there were some extra weights. Okay, so uh, to conclude. Uh, for two, we only need to know, of course, x, y, the link function. Uh, why do we need the variance function? I'm not sure we actually need the variance function. No, I don't know why I say this. Uh, you need phi, not the variance function. So where do you start, actually, right? So clearly, if you start very close to your solution, you're actually going to do much better. And one good way to start, so for the beta itself, it's not clear what it's going to be. But you can actually get a good idea of what beta is by just having a good idea of what mu is. Because mu is g inverse of xi transpose beta. And so what you could do is to try to set mu to be the actual observations that you have. Because you know that's the best guess that you have for their expected value. And then you just say, OK, once I have my mu, I know that my mu is a function of this thing. So I can write g of mu and solve it using a least squares estimator, right? So g of mu is of the form x beta. So you just solve um, for once you have your mu, you pass it through g, and then you solve for the beta that you want. And then that's the beta that you initialize with. Okay? 
And uh, actually, this was your question from last time. As soon as I use the canonical link, Fisher scoring and uh, uh, Newton Raphson are the same thing because the uh, Hessian is actually deterministic in that case. Just because when we took this, when you, the H in, um, when you, you use the canonical link, H is the identity, which means that its second derivative is equal to zero. So this term goes away even without taking the expectation, right? So remember, the term that went away was of the form yi minus mu i divided by phi times h prime prime of xi transpose beta, right? That's the term that we said, oh, the conditional expectation of this guy is zero. But if h prime prime is already equal to zero, then there's nothing that changes. There's nothing that goes away. It was already equal to zero. And that always happened when you have the canonical link because h is g prime, uh, is g uh, d prime inverse. And uh, g is equal to d, the canonical link is d prime inverse. So this thing is the identity. So the second derivative of y of uh, f of x is equal to x is zero. Okay. My screen says end of show. Uh, so we can start with some questions. Um, I just wanted to know what the iterative um, what is the correct way? Reweighted least squares. That's an implementation that's just making calls to weighted least squares oracles. It's called an oracle sometimes. An oracle is what you assume the machine can do easily for you. So if you assume that your machine is very good at you know, multiplying by the inverse of a matrix, you might as well just do fission scoring yourself, right? It's just a way so that you don't have to actually do it. And those things usually, um, uh, those things are implemented and I just said routinely in statistical software, but they're implemented if very efficiently in statistical software. So this is gonna be one of the fastest ways you're gonna have to solve, uh, to, 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 to do this step especially for large scale problems. Like the computers can do this for like large scale problems. Um, what's the best computer to do that implementation? So if you were to do this uh, in the simplest possible way, right, your iterations for the uh, weighted, uh, for uh, say uh, Fisher scoring mm -hmm. is uh, just multiplied by the inverse of the Fisher information, right? So it's not gonna take that long, right? Yeah, so it takes a bit of time, uh, whereas, uh, since you know you're gonna uh, multiply it directly by something, uh, if you just say those things are not as optimized as solving least squares. Actually, the way it's typically done is by doing some least squares. So you might as well just do the least squares that you like. And there's also less, um, uh, well, no, there's no, well, there is less recompute, rec recalculation, right? Here, you, Fisher, you would have to recompute the entire matrix of Fisher information, whereas here you don't have to. Right, you really just have to compute like some vectors and the vector of weight, right? So the Fisher information matrix has say, n choose two entries that you need to compute, right? It's symmetric, so it's order n squared entries. But here, the only things you update, if you think about it, are this weight matrix. And so there's only the diagonal elements that you need to update and this vectors and they're also, so those are sized, there's two n versus n squared. So there's much less thing to actually put in there. It does it for you somehow. Any other question? All right, so, yeah. So if I have a computer that does uh, such a thing, can I still apply mod to it and just do it for each time? Yeah, you can. Just so that it's not scanning my weights each time I uh, do my multiplication. Well, not exactly, right? Because the G also shows up in this correction that you have here, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't know what you mean by Yeah, I mean, uh, well, okay, there's the heteroscedastic case for sure. Yeah. So if you can actually compute those things and you know, more generally, I don't think you should think of those as being weights. You should really think of those as being matrices that you invert and don't think of it as being diagonal, but really think of them as being like full matrices. So if you have, right, when we wrote uh, uh, weighted least squares here, uh, this was really, uh, the W I said is diagonal, but all the computations really never really use the fact that it's diagonal. So this is what you, what shows up here is just the inverse of your covariance matrix. And so if you have data that's correlated, this is where it's gonna show up. 